All right, hello everybody. I can see many of you are starting to connect and enter the webinar. We are going to start right now. Okay, good afternoon everyone. I am delighted to welcome all of you to our first webinar, focusing on property investment opportunities in Canary Wharf and a brand new development Aspen apartment in London developed by FHC. My name is Alia Wahid from Benham and Reeves. I am based in Jakarta. Our office is in Equity SCBD. So if you would like to meet with us, I am looking forward to uh, meet all of you and help you in uh, all your international property investments. I will be your host today and we have a uh, an exciting discussion with our esteemed panel of speakers. Um, one of them is my colleague, Widya Lestaluhu, International Director of Benham and Reeves with 15 plus uh, years in uh, expertise in international property sales. And we also have Stephen McDonald from Far East Consortium or FEC, a leading international developer specializing in high quality uh, residential and mixed use developments across Europe and in the UK. Last but not least, we also have Marian Jenkoff, Director of Capricorn Financial, one of the London's leading mortgage and property finance consultants. So without further ado, let's start the discussion of the webinar today. I will pass the um, floor to my colleague, Vidya. Good evening, everybody. Um, how are you today? Apa kabar semua? Um, it's been a long time since I have been um, in Jakarta, so I'm really looking forward to meet all of you very soon. Uh, thank you, Alia, for the introduction. Uh, as she has said, I'm Widya from Benjamin Reeves. Uh, before I begin, I do apologize in advance because I'm a little bit unwell, so I may excuse myself uh, for a little uh, a bit in between if needed, but I'll do my very best to uh, give you the best insight on London property. Before we begin, um, I'm sure a lot of you have questions of who Benham and Reeves is. While we may be new in Indonesia, we actually have 60 years, over 60 years of London property expertise on the ground knowledge. So in London alone, we have 21 brushes across London with 15 international offices. So I'm very proud to be able to open up um, Indonesian office alongside Alia. Um, so Ben and Reeves, what do we do? We actually give a full circle one-stop shop uh, advisory firm to our clientele. Starting from investment advice, we really sit down to connect with you to understand your investment needs, recommending you the right proposition uh, that fits your requirement. Uh, the next step is, of course, to handhold you um, and, and assist you with your purchasing journey alongside your, uh, your selected solicitor as well as your mortgage advisor. And I know many of you are concerned that you're miles away, thousands of miles away from London, not to fret upon completion. Our on-site team will be there to handle the handover for you ensuring that they uh, complete the inspection and snagging to ensure that the delivery of the uh, property is uh, top-notch. We also have our own in-house furnishing company called Install Direct. So we are there to also provide consultancy on interior design, uh, furnishing and refurbishment. Not uh, Last but not least, uh, the most important part is of course, Lettings and property management, which is actually our core business. This is our true expertise being in London for over 60 years. So not to worry because we will be there with our colleagues to assist you uh, during this rental investment journey. We actually just acquired a, a accountancy firm that is now part of Benham and Reeves because we want to ensure that you have the complete service. So every year upon uh, when it's time to uh, file your tax, we can assist with the tax returns all in-house. And after years of enjoying uh, your rental income and you have uh, realized the appreciation of your property and it's time to sell, we are also here to provide you the resale service. 
Right. So before we talk about why London, I really want to focus on these three highlights that are worth mentioning. First, it's very important and good to note that inflation rate has come down uh, since October 2023, which is a very positive sign. Uh, second point is that there has no uh, there has not been any change in interest rates for the last three cycles, which Marion will be talking about later in greater detail. These are all signs of stability and easing of the interest rate. London rents, this is the most exciting part. The London private rents has gone up by an astonishing 30% since 2021. All these uh, promising stats are very encouraging and that is why investors are starting to talk to us again because they want to relook at investment into London market. Our latest market update is actually available on our website. Uh, it's just uploaded on our video hub, so feel free to request for access. So, Really, the fundamental drivers remain strong, and that is why London is still a top pick for a lot of overseas investors looking for long-term wealth preservations, as they really view London as one of the world's most trusted safe haven assets. Now, the first key fundamental factor is the population size. We are seeing a rapid growing population in London. The Greater London Authority is forecasting that London's population will continue to grow by at least another million in the next decade. London housing is really not able to keep up with its growing population. So that then uh, brings us to supply because supply is not actually keeping pace to the growing populations. These statistics are actually from the National Statistics Board, and it indicated that by 2026, we will see a shortfall of almost 300,000 homes. This leaves London property in a very critical position. So very basic economics, when demand goes up, supply goes down, what can we expect? Price growth. The gap keeps widening, and when that continues to happen, the price will continue to grow. And it's all been reported um, multiple times in the, the media. So as I've said, our core business is slattings and we have all the stats. We are actually seeing an average number of 25 applicants per rental listing uh, currently versus eight during the pre-pandemic. Demand for rental tenants has gone up by 41% since 2019 but the number of properties available to rent is down by 35%. And of course, this leads to a contra uh, contra uh, contraction in rental supply that has led to a surge in rental values. Even for myself, I have properties in London for investment. Um, just to give you an example, at renewal last year, my rent increased from 1,250 pounds to 1,850 pounds. So that uh, I'm, I'm due for another uh, renewal. And uh, I've been talking to my colleagues to review the rental for my property and um, I'll be expecting a increase in my rental as well. So that is why for me, I'm not just uh, presenting to you about property because it's my career, but it's also because I am very, very um, invested in the London property market myself. So you can see that overseas institution investors are also gearing up to add residential asset into their investment plan and portfolio. Um, these names uh, should be not unfamiliar to you. Singapore CDL, they have always been in London property. And uh, end of last year, they continued to expand their portfolio by buying in London and Manchester. Gamuda Land, if you are from Asia, you know them as a leading Malaysian uh, property developer. They also build all over the world, including Australia and London. They also invested heavily in London. Spanish billionaires as well, European investors as well, they're all looking to invest in London. Blackstone, everyone knows Blackstone. They are the world's largest alternative asset manager. And recently, they just started the construction of their European headquarters, choosing London to be their home for a long time in Europe. So despite Brexit, 
you can see that London still ranks top two as a global financial hub uh, in the world. You still have big companies such as Apple, Amazon, Google that still set their headquarters in London. London is not just driven by traditional banking service anymore. It's a truly diverse economy with varying sectors, including fintech, tech companies, and education, which plays a big part in their economy. And I'm sure a lot of you are parents and you are looking at, um, you know, sending your kids for future uh, tertiary education and at the same time looking at housing and investment, you'll be glad to know that year after year after year, London still uh, ranks number one as the best student cities, uh, which is all very promising. And it's not a surprise because London is truly have one of the world renowned education system and quality. Plus, it's a, city, it's a city full of creativity, art, and culture. London University has nearly over 66,000 more students enrolled today than in 2019. And this number is expected to grow, which will also drive up demand for high quality accommodation. So I have a lot of clients that ask, what is the forecast for London? So I've uh, actually, Grab this uh, from the latest research by JLL, um, where they are predicting that the average sales price growth per annum is at 3.7%, and the rental average growth is at 5.2%. So the cumulative rate from now to 2028 is 19.9% and 28.8% respectively. And, you know, Asians, we all love investment. We also invest everywhere around the world. I just highlighted these key uh, locations that a lot of Asians, Indonesians like to invest in. And you will be pleased to know that the additional stamp duty or cost uh, for foreign ownership in UK is actually the lowest uh, when you compare it against Australia, Singapore, and Singapore, which is an astonishing 60%, only 2% additional stamp duty that you have to pay when you invest in London, which is a very important uh, key to note uh, by a lot of our foreign investors. And if you are an investor, you have to know what your tenant wants. <clears throat> we did a, a regular survey because we want to be in touch with understanding the trends of uh, tenants <clears throat> and renting. A lot of tenants like to buy uh, or rent close to train stations with quick connectivity to universities and workplace, with high-speed broadband amenities like supermarket, cafe clinic, on-site facilities, and concierge. That's I'm back. Uh, excuse me. So now we talk about property trends in Canary Wharf and the forecast. <laughs> Canary Wharf is truly one of my favorite uh, destination in London. It is in zone two, uh, borough of Hamlet. And like I said before, it's a leading financial hub with diverse uh, activity, commerce activities. And uh, it is a center for trade, employment, profit within London. Now, Canary Wharf is a buzzing business and residential district with lots of outstanding skyscrapers, state-of-the-art apartment buildings, hotels, and uh, places of interest. So I'm just showing you a quick snapshot of uh, numbers in Canary Wharf. The average price is uh, five just above 500,000 uh, pounds. The rental price have been growing year on year in Canary Wharf. We are looking at a range of 325 pounds per week up to 2,200 pounds per week, which is very, very good. Uh, and uh, if you read reports on Canary Wharf, they are aiming to add more than 100,000 jobs by 2031, which means new talent for you. And it's also very important to note that 
the latest spring 2024 budget, Chancellor Hunt actually mentioned the regeneration of the East, which includes Canary Wharf. So we are creating more homes in Canary Wharf in the coming years. Snapshot headline numbers of Canary Wharf. Uh, these are the, the key fun facts that I would like to highlight. Uh, you can see that because Canary Wharf has, uh, Canary Wharf Group has done a very good job in placemaking, it is now a destination for leisure leading play work. Last year, they recorded the highest ever visitors at 67.2 million, which is incredible. And it's not a surprise that uh, even parents are now buying into Canary Wharf or having their kids renting in the Canary Wharf because it is truly a safest, in my opinion, the safest in, uh, location in London. There is no other place in London whereby you have 24 hours civilians and security patrolling on site. So that's why it has become very, very popular. Uh, and you can see as well the average income um, uh, of, of workers in Canary Wharf is actually higher than the national average. Um, yeah. And of course, like I said earlier, the rents have grown up year on year. So you see Canary Wharf uh, is one of London's most affordable areas. Yet, affordability is increasing over the last five years because salary has risen and property values in Canary Wharf remain stable. Yep. So, like I said, it has uh, positioned, repositioned itself, not just as a financial hub, but with the investment and regeneration, you are seeing um, it as a destination, as a new life science hub. Uh, to kind of like keep up with market trends. They are also introducing uh, University of Sunderland in London, which will be based in uh, Canary Wharf. And it's also aiming to develop business, finance, tourism, and health-related programs. So it's really no surprise that more people are wanting to live here, especially since Elizabeth Line has improved connectivity to more areas across London and undoubtedly helped speed up its transformation. So you also have public art, green spaces, uh, which I'll show in my uh, next few slides. Like I said, in Canary Wharf, you have over 100,000 executives uh, living and working in Canary Wharf, highest salary postcode. And, uh, and it's not just your traditional bank, you also have Deliveroo, um, even government institutions have all moved to uh, Canary Wharf, including British American Tobacco. So as I mentioned, transportation is second to none. In Canary Wharf, you have the Underground Jubilee Line, which is the newest or latest line uh, in the underground system, tube system. You have Dockland Side Rail that service the city and the east of London. The most exciting Elizabeth line that opened two years ago is really the game changer because it really con cuts the traveling time by a massive time. Not forgetting that you are also very close to London City Airport. So for business and um, you know tourist travelers, you are able to get to the airport in just 17 minutes. Not forgetting that if you're bored of the traditional transport, there's also river bus that brings you across London. I mentioned uh, earlier, with Elizabeth Wine, it's really the dezoning of London. Now, you can travel to the city in only seven minutes. Bond Street for the West End and shopping in 14 minutes, and Heathrow in 40 minutes. So really because of this well connectivity, it kind of like, Dizone London and a lot of things are actually moving east. All the school institutions, VNA moving east. City Hall, which is the mayor's uh, mayor of London's office, they uh, have relocated from uh, South Bank to the east of London in their new home office. UCL, because the education is booming, 
they need to expand the added new uh, faculties, new um, um, courses. So they have actually relocated to East Campus and BBC Music Studio as well. Not forgetting that London City Airport is also going through a major expansion. So by the end of next year, you will be able to move, uh, travel to more destination globally from London City Airport. Vibrant lifestyle in Canary Wharf uh, is actually very incredible because I've been doing this for like 15 years. Every year when I uh, return back to London, every year when I return to Canary Wharf, that's really, I, I'm, I'm impressed all the time because, uh, you know, 15 years ago, I will never imagine that you could play beach volleyball in the middle of a financial district. Or you will be able to have picnic and sunbathe by the harbor uh, square park. And also with the Retro's Plaza at lunchtime, it's very vibrant. You have like food trucks where you can get your quick lunch as well. And also unique things to do in Canary Wharf, uh, like hot tubs, go-kart, ice ring. Um, last December over Christmas, I actually visited Canary Wharf as well. Um, and I actually, with my family and friends, um, enjoyed the ice rink. It's very beautiful during Christmas. You have Christmas lights. It's such a vibe. And uh, these are some of my favorite restaurants in Canary uh, in London. So Dishum Hawksmoor, you have it in West End. But now they chose Canary Wharf to have their next brunch. So it really tells a lot about Canary Wharf as a destination for people to enjoy the time with their friends festivals and uh, events as well. A lot of fashion shows, uh, food events that have uh, consistently happened in Canary Wharf. In fact, you can actually follow Canary Wharf Group uh, Instagram to see what is the latest trends and events that they're hold holding throughout the year. So now, I hope that gives you a little bit of insight about Canary Wharf. Now, I would of course like to spotlight our most exciting development called Aspen by FBC. Aspen is truly the jewel in the crown uh, of Consort Place that is a new destination created by uh, Far East Consortium. You have cafes, you have bars, you have education and health center, and not forgetting the internationally known Dorset Hotel. So where it is uh, in reference to London, very close to the underground and the crossroad station. Some of the units will give you fantastic views across London. You get the River Thames view, um, Shard City of London view, and on the east side, you also get the O2 arena. This is just some updates on the construction sites. This is where um, Aspen is. And you can see the proximity to the big banks. These are all your potential tenants working for JP Morgan, Citibank, and so on. Snapshots. Also close to the city. From Tower Bridge, you can see it. So eventually when it's completed by the end of the year, Aspen will be an iconic tower that will add on to the beautiful skylines of London. Like I said, they're not just about building a building, or building a tower, they're all about placemaking. So on site, they will uh, also have restaurants, pop education hub, um, <clears throat> squares for entertainment and events. Uh, World-class amenities, uh, you can have, uh, yeah, this is part of the uh, Aspen development <coughs> where you have a gym, private lounge area, playroom, uh, games room, vitality spa room. <coughs> so I think it's enough of me talking because I need to catch a breath. So it's about time that I introduce Stephen, who is from Fires Consortium. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Wadia, and thanks for powering through with the cold. Um, 
Hi, I'm Stephen. I am the head of sales for Far East Consortium UK. Um, Far East Consortium have been listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange since 1972. We operate across 10 different countries um, with many different strands to the business. Um, our main strand is residential development, where we have £5 billion pounds worth of assets under management. We develop across the UK, Australia, Singapore, Malaysia, China, to name but a few. We also have a hospitality business, Dorset Hotels, where we are operational across 10 countries and have recently expanded into Japan. In the UK, <clears throat> we have been here since 2012, and we have very quickly established ourselves as one of the largest developers in the UK, with a pipeline of over 18,000 homes. And we use the 50 years of experience of international experience combined with the local expertise on the ground in the UK. And we are very quickly going to be one of the most reputable developers um, globally and across the UK. Uh, we have 4,000 employees worldwide and we will very quickly be expanding into new territories as well. A uh, consort place is uh, completing this year and over the last two years has been one of the fastest selling developments in central London. That's because of the location, the product that we are delivering, and most importantly, the price point we are selling at. And investors and end users alike are seeing real value in what we are offering here. Um, any other questions, or I think it's to move on to Marion now to give um, some more advice on the interest rates and mortgage market. Thank you, Stephen. Oh, wait, oh, wait, oh, wait. Hello, can you guys? I hope everyone can hear me well. Uh, I'm Marion from Capricorn Financial, and thank you very much, Widya and Stephen, uh, for the presentation. I will talk to you about mortgages. Um, so, um, yeah, of course, as I mentioned, we're Capricorn Financial. I myself am based in Hong Kong. Um, we do have an office also in Singapore, and we very much cater for overseas investors into the UK. Of course, I'm here to um, to talk to you a little bit about uh, the market and who Capricorn are. Um, <laughs> just a, a brief overview of who we really are. Um, we're uh, the largest uh, in independent mortgage broker in the UK. We now have more than 65 advisors. And of course, we speak your language. So we're based, um, I'm in Hong Kong. I don't, unfortunately, I don't speak uh, Bahasa Indonesian or I don't speak Cantonese, but we do have uh, colleagues that do. And as I mentioned, we have offices in Singapore, Hong Kong, Dubai, and Shanghai. Very important to know, we are new build specialists. We do we deal with many, many transactions um, annually for new build properties. It's slightly different than buying secondhand. Um, and we've done over 2.2 billion of gross lending um, last year. Uh, very important to know, we're whole of market. So we, we don't have access to just one bank. We have access to all the lenders that lend on UK property. So whoever may be the best option for you. That's where we'll go and help you out with the whole process. We don't charge anything up front. Our fee is only payable upon approval or, or um, mortgage offer, as we call it, from the bank, which is uh, which is £1,500. And we are strategic partners with um, some of the kind of well, best lenders in the UK, but also the likes of FEC and Benham and Reeves. So we get exclusive products, which I will talk to you uh, later. This is kind of a colorful product will as we like to show some of these banks you would uh, recognize some of them you might not so on the left hand side here you may recognize the likes of hsbc may bank but there are other lenders that you may not recognize that doesn't mean they're bad lenders it just means they are specialist buy to let lenders that are not on the high street 
So they, they do not have a shop that you can walk into. If your situation is more on the private banking side, at the top right here, we have some of the private banks that we can also go to. Now, the market summary. Uh, everyone asks me what are the rates? That's kind of the first question. Of course, the rates in the UK have been uh, going up since, uh, well, since COVID really, and end of 2022. But let's be honest, we were very much spoiled of having very low rates since 2008. Um, as you can see, um, the Bank of England base rate of 5.25, as William mentioned earlier, has been held twice, so it didn't go up. Previously, it would go up every month almost, which usually shows a bit of stability. Have we reached the peak? I think so. Most of my colleagues and most of the people in the industry seem to think that the rates or the base rate will start dropping towards the end of this year, start of next year. Um, and we've already actually seen some banks decrease their rates simply because of the lower inflation rates um, and the lower swap rates. So, yep, um, even though in higher kind of um, mortgage rate climate, people still, buyers still take uh, mortgages. That's mainly for kind of your tax purposes and savings. And of course, uh, the power of leverage, you know, your money might be worth uh, elsewhere. So uh, borrowing is still very popular. Um, and of course, and nowadays there are, you know, more banks entering the market, entering the kind of overseas investor market. It's um, it's something that's very, very popular, especially in areas like Canary Wharf and the likes of Aspen. So uh, there's more and more banks available to people based in, in Asia and Southeast Asia. And as I mentioned already, without any decreases in the base rate, there are some banks that have decreased their rates, which is very, very positive news for the market. Um, moving forward, um, we have, there we go, terms, rates and fees. Everyone says, what's what's the rate? What's my rate? Of course, we might be on the same call here, but that doesn't mean everyone's situation is the same. But the basics are um, up to 75% loan to value is technically available. I usually suggest going up to 65, 70. It just gives you more options, opens up uh, more lenders and you just have a uh, slightly higher choice. Buy to let interest rates or buy to let means it's a, it, the property will be rented out. They start at 3.99 and I'll talk to you about it later. This is an exclusive rate for the Aspen, for, for, the, for the property. Uh, and it's been agreed uh, with Stephen and FEC, which is amazing. It's a really, really it's by far the most, uh, the, the cheapest rate uh, out there. And of course, if someone wants to do higher deposit, if you want to do 50, 50, 50 borrowing and 50 deposit, you have options, you have more options. Um, many, many uh, kind of clients out of Asia, they say, you know, what's my, what's my age restriction? Um, because the Asian lenders usually lend up to the age of 70 or retirement. However, a lot of the UK banks don't have a maximum age. So you don't need to really worry about that. Um, one of the biggest differences between um, between mortgages in Asia and in the UK is that in, in the UK, interest only is something that's very available. It's, it's basically the most popular product for um, investors. What that means is on a monthly basis, the bank only wants the interest payment. So you're not actually repaying your mortgage. The rates are the same. How that benefits you is you have lower monthly payments and you can make overpayments whenever you want to up to 10% of the of the mortgage you have taken out so actually it's a very flexible uh, product you can repay uh, with kind of up to 10% whenever you want if you don't want to and you feel like your money's worth um more elsewhere you don't have to uh, of course you can ask me uh, more about that because i'm sure there will be a lot of questions an exclusive rate there we go so as I mentioned earlier, we believe that the rates will start dropping towards the end of this year, start of next year. So we have this one one year gap almost that we kind of want to, you know, we need to swallow a higher rate and then everything will get better later. We believe that the rates will drop to around three, three and a half percent in the next two to three years. So um, we've come up with a product which is fixed for one year. So from whenever your property completes the next 12 months, your rate is fixed at 3.99. It's available uh, up to 70% loan to value, of course, subject to underwriting and, and um, each per borrower's circumstances. The lender arrangement fee, so the lender charges a one-off arrangement fee of 2.5% of the purchase price. Uh, so, sorry, this is 2.5% of the loan value, actually, not the purchase price. 
However, this is quite a standard one. Um, a lot of the lenders would charge 2% anyway. Um, so 2.5% of the loan value, and it's available on Aspen purchases. Interest only is also available um, at 4.74. So it's only 0 0.75 more. And you'll see some calculations later. This product can be fully based on the rental income of the property. So if someone doesn't want to provide or doesn't have kind of active income at the moment, um, this lender can go simply off the rental value of the subject property. Usually the maximum borrowing then would be around 50%. Um, yep, going forward, um, I've just pressed back by accident. Let me go forward. There we go. So, yep, or you can ask me about that later. But this is a, a absolute exclusive for Aspen. Um, other developers, other um, kind of um, properties do not have this kind of product. There we go. So we have some recommendations here, which um, which have been picked by Benham's and FEC. So kind of the, the best unit at the moment for investors out there, just so you can see how it looks like with the product that I showed you. So purchase price, 650,000, 27 floor, breathtaking views of London. Um, and you're borrowing 60% loan to value. That means 40% deposit. The gross monthly rent, 4.7%, super high for London, really, really good. Um, net monthly rental after that, just short of £2,000. And if you want to do a mortgage, a standard capital repayment mortgage, your monthly payments will be just over £2,000. So it pretty much covers, um, your, your rental pretty much covers it. If you do interest only, you have £1,541 of monthly payments. Really good. That's five, almost £500 in your pocket. Call it £400 in your pocket every month. That's for a studio. Moving forward, the recommended one bed, again, views right into the city. Um, it's 34th floor, uh, really, really cool unit. Um, borrowing 60% uh, again. Your net monthly income is £2,589. And your monthly payments, even on a capital and interest, or how they call P plus I here, it's uh, much more, it's 300 pounds, 200 pounds higher. Um, and of course, if you do interest only, you're getting about 800 pounds in your pocket uh, each month. So basically the property washes its own face. Uh, you don't need to uh, put your hand in your pocket each month. And the two bed, um, again, really, really nice unit. We're looking at 5.3% yield, which is really, really good. Um, and net monthly income after all the, the, the charges is about £3,000 or just over. And as you can see on an interest only, you have a pretty, pretty um, healthy um, income per month. So it looks very, very good with this product. And of course, in one year's time, when the product uh, fixed period ends, you can refinance that to a cheaper rate, whatever's available at the time. It becomes much easier to refinance once you already own the property, There's, the, the rates are cheaper. Cool. Uh, UK banks versus kind of Indonesia bank. I just wanted to just show you um, a little bit. So a lot of people say, why should I borrow in the UK? Why can't I borrow in my own country? few things. Currency risk. If you borrow in, um, you know, uh, in, in rupees and then you, your asset is in GBP, there's obviously the currency risk. If one goes uh, bad, um, you know, your, your investment might not have the same returns as you expect. Um, you cannot offset any tax if you borrow uh, in on your assets. Um, in Indonesia, you cannot offset any tax later. Um, it might be secured against your own home, which is very, very risky. You might as well secure the loan on the on an additional property or buy to let property in the UK. Um, it might very well in Indonesia, they will look at your income or your local income in the UK, not necessarily. Uh, you cannot do interest only in Indonesia. And uh, I believe the rates are actually quite high uh, by Indonesian banks from my research. So you know, uh, the rates in the UK are actually cheaper at the moment. And as we said, yeah, the loan will be in the same currency. So no currency risk there should one of the currencies um, not, not do so well or should it do well. Um, and you can offset a lot of the costs from your tax bill later on. Um, and yeah, basically it's a buy to let. Um, you want it to be based on that property and do interest only. You can fix your rate for up to five years if you wanted to. Moving forward. Application process. I know these units are completing very soon, so you can start speaking to me very now, uh, very, very much now. So uh, speak to me straight away. Uh, we can set up a call, um, and I can basically do a full assessment on your situation within one or two days. I can be 
I can send you the breakdown of the loan with all the fees involved, all the costs involved and everything. And then we can, once you reserve, obviously, you can start, we can start the uh, application process. That means taking all the documents, I get to review them, uh, submit them to the bank, and I hold your hand through the whole process. It takes about two to three months, really. Uh, get the mortgage offer out, and then you can relax. The mortgage offer is valid for six months, so we can just wait for the property to complete. Long story short, um, I am here to help you uh, and guide you through the whole process. Speak to me, ask me questions. I can help you how to structure your purchase, whether individual names, guarantors, it might be, you might be buying for kids, whatever it may be. But that's what we're here to do, guide you through the process and help you complete on time. And that's about it from me. So thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you uh, to all of our speakers. Uh, thanks, Vidya, and Steven, and Mary. Um, so we are now entering the Q&A sessions. So for all of our attendees, this is your time to type in your uh, questions in the question box. Uh, yeah, so we will start right now. Let's see. So it 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 is uh, uh, attracting a lot of uh, questions here, especially on Marianne's uh, topic. So please uh, stay there. Don't go anywhere, Marianne. We will start with a question for Stephen. Uh, is there an oversupply in Canary Wharf, and um, what is the vacancy rate at the uh, at the moment over there? Yeah, so starting with the over supply question, um, it's it's quite the opposite. Um, generally across the UK, there is a critical shortfall in housing. It's more concentrated in central London and Canary Wharf is no different. There's a lot of reasons for this. The UK government have made it very difficult for developers with their planning requirements. Um, there is construction inflation, and you know it's a lot more expensive to build these days. And in Canary Wharf, there is a real lack of land left to build on. So land comes at a real premium for developers. So all of that basically means that there just isn't that many properties being delivered. The last apartments to be delivered in Canary Wharf was around three years ago. Um, at a time when the demand for property locally has never been higher. You can see that from the stats that Widya showed earlier. So, um, yeah, quite the opposite of an oversupply. That That isn't unique to Canary Wharf, but it is very much so concentrated um, uh, in Canary Wharf and more under the focus. In terms of vacancy rates, um, I'm assuming you mean um, in terms of residential vacancy rates, um, you know, there's void periods on average, I believe locally, are around three days per year. So as soon as a property becomes vacant, um, Benham's would relist your property in advance of the expiry date of the lease. The property is cleaned and it's turned around and it's straight back out. Um, there is a shortage of private landlords in central London. Um, the interest rates have pushed out some of the domestic UK landlords, you know, amateur landlords that just want to sell up. Um, that's created a real shortage of supply in rental homes, and that has created the boom in rents, um, which in turn is good for your investment. And that is only going to continue over the short to middle and uh, medium term future. That is incredible. Mm -hmm. Now would be a good time for all of our Indonesian uh, investors to invest in Canary Wharf. So uh, for Widya, I have a question for you. Uh, what is the estimated rental yield? Marianne has uh, spoken about it a little bit, but I noticed there are uh, some attendees that just arrived. So maybe mm -hmm. you can give like a, a brief summary on what to expect. Yeah, sure. So uh, I've mentioned in my presentation earlier that rents have gone up uh, since 2021. We are seeing 30 percent um, increase in private rents. So that's very promising to begin with. Now, the forecast for 
canary wharf uh, or the estimated forecast for Aspen in terms of the gross yield are ranging between 4.7% to 5.7%, uh, which is very strong in my opinion. Um, you know, less of your um, expenses, which is only the service charge and the lettings and management fee that you pay to us, you're looking at around 3.5% on average of your net yield. Um, and I think uh, as an investment proposition, especially when you speak to Marion to look at the kind of financing that you can get, uh, like what he mentioned before, you can opt for interest only loans, which is not heard of in Asia, but it's actually very popular in the UK myself as well. I refinance all my property from uh, Asian banks to UK banks with the interest only loan to kind of like manage my cash flow at the moment while we wait for the interest rate to ease off. So I hope that answer your question in terms of the yields and the returns that you can expect uh, when you invest in Aspen. All right, thank you. Uh, now we are going to um, mortgage questions for Marion. Um, so, uh, subject to approval, Indonesians will get 3.9% um, uh, on the first year. What will be uh, the rate after that? Perfect. Yep. Thank you. Uh, good question. So there's a follow on rate or what we call the SVR standard variable rate. Typically, that's between three, it's around three to four percent above Bank of England base. Now, Obviously, Bank of England base is expected to drop. So I couldn't tell you exactly what it would be because, you know, if if the base rate drops to 3% or 3.5%, then you're looking at set around a 7% mark or just below. Now, that being said, that means you stay with the same product. After one year, you have no tie-ins or any ties with that uh, product. So you can refinance. That's what everyone does because you purchase it now when when the rates are a little bit on the higher side usually so usually the rates at the moment are around six seven percent um if it wasn't for that um kind of product then after that you can refinance to a probably around a five percent five and a bit uh to another bank banks in the uk love refinancing so they usually give cheaper rates to people moving from one bank to another um, or like no fees or nothing like up front so basically it's an easier process once you already own the property so you should never really, people never really go on a standard variable rate unless you really want to. Um, yeah, I don't see why you would, but uh, technically, yeah, you, you would refinance or you you pay a, a three or 4% above the Bank of England base rate at the time. Okay, um, next question. Um, I am based in, in, in Indonesia. How long will it take to approve a mortgage uh, to buy UK property? And I will combine this with what documents are needed. Lovely. Uh, yep. Yeah, so typically, um, the lenders would do about two to two to three months, I would say, in total. To be honest, I've had it done in about three to four weeks as well. It really depends on the, the kind of pace of communication and how quickly I get the documents that I need. Of course, it depends on how difficult each client situation is. Um, truth is, going to the document side, the standard documentation is obviously proof of ID, so a copy of your passport, certified proof of your proof of address, which is a utility bill that shows your address. Um, typically, three months of bank statements where you receive your income. If you're employed working for a big company and we'd want to use your income to get the maximum borrowing, then you're getting about, uh, then, you, then you need three months pay slips from your employer. If you own your own business, it's usually, uh, let's say two years of your company accounts showing your profit. If you say, Marion, actually, I don't want to use my income. I just want to base it on the rental. Then we don't need any of that income. We just need the bank statements, proof of deposit. So proof of wealth, how you've accumulated the deposit, which is usually six months of wealth or well, kind of uh, deposit accumulation. And yeah, all the other stuff is just, typical um, you know, forms and um, compliance documents from the bank side. So ID, proof of income, proof of address, proof of deposit, um, and that's pretty much it. There's, there's about five or six uh, main documents. Of course, the, the underwriter might request more information should they see, not an issue, but should they see anything in the bank statements. So you know, they could ask more. 
Excellent. Uh, right. Uh, bear with me. We have so many questions at the moment. Um, all right. This one is for Stephen. Uh, are there any impact for Canary Wharf as Moody and HSBC are moving to the city? Hi. Yeah. So I'm acutely aware that the news of HSBC, who are one of the original anchor tenants in Canary Wharf, in the, from the 1980s are moving to the city? Um, the short answer is no, it's not going to impact in Canary Wharf. HSBC have always been one of the more flexible banks in terms of working from home. So their office is just simply no longer fit for purpose. Um, and they are moving to a brand new, cheaper office space in the city that suits their their needs because the workforce isn't as large anymore. You know, the way I look at it as, you know, Citibank are, are in the process of spending a hundred million pounds and are actually expanding their office space for their 9,000 employees for the office block that they bought a few years ago for 1.2 billion pounds. So, you know, Citibank who are actually a larger employer in the district have committed. JP Morgan who have their European headquarters in uh, Canary Wharf. They're also spending money and refurbishing their office to make it new, green and sustainable. Canary Wharf Group have also just delivered a brand new 400,000 square foot of office space um, in Reuters Plaza. Revolut, the digital bank, have pre-let 25% of that office space already. And there's lots of new um, local government, construction companies, tech companies that are all moving in as well. Um, and the way that I would say is footfall is up 30% compared to 2020, uh, 2022 with 67 million. So again, it just demonstrates that yes, Canary Wharf is an office location and it always will be that, but there is just so much more going on there that, um, you know, just one tenant leaving isn't going to have any kind of impact on what is going on there. Um, and that is backed up by all these high-end restaurants um, and bars moving to the area. They, they would not be moving there and opening up because it's not a cheap space for them to open up either from a retail point of view. You know, they, they wouldn't be opening up these, these places if they thought that there was going to be any impact with somebody like HSBC leaving. Yeah, so it is just not more, not only a financial hub now, they should change the name to financial and lifestyle hub. That, that's absolutely correct. And to yeah. be fair, that is exactly what the Canary Wharf Group have been doing for the last three or four years. You know, they are moving away from just being known as that commercial and finance hub. Yes, it still is the biggest financial hub in the UK and Europe, but it is so much more than that now. Great, thank you. Uh, next to Marianne, uh, this is a very good question. Um, do you have an offset account in the UK banking? For example, you borrow 500K, but you have 200K in your other account. Bank only charge interest on the difference. They have this in Australia. Yep, good question. Absolutely, that is uh, something that's available. Not every bank does it. Um, not every bank does it for sure. It's It really, really depends on the client situation. The, the lender that we spoke about just now, actually, uh, they do have that kind of facility. I personally will need to double check whether it is available through the exclusive product. I'm pretty sure it would be because I don't see why it wouldn't be. Uh, of course, if someone, most of the kind of high street banks or the ones that are lending below Let's use those numbers as an example, 500K uh, borrowing. A lot of, most of the banks wouldn't, but if we're looking at a borrowing above a million or you're buying multiple units, then we can look at the private banks and the private banks certainly have that kind of option where you can put some assets under management with them to offset your um, the interest. But that being said, there are some other typical buy to let lenders that would do it. So the answer is, short answer is yes. Um, and actually, I'm just going to answer the next one because I've, uh, um, yeah, I've, I've seen a few of those are basically uh, all mortgage related. Um, so yes. as I mentioned, the approval would take, I'd say, two to three months, uh, can be done quicker. And 
in terms of Asian investors, to be honest, uh, so one of the questions is, is, do most Asian investors select an interest only mortgage or repayment mortgage? It's not even just Asian investors. Every, even UK investors at the moment select uh, interest only. It really doesn't make much sense to do a repayment mortgage because your monthly payments will be quite high. Now, don't forget also that if someone is, for example, um, I, I don't know, like let, let's say you're, you don't, uh, which doesn't really happen in the UK, but you don't, you don't have a tenant for a week or something. You kind of want to keep the monthly payments as cheap as possible. Or the rate goes up or something like that. You want to keep your monthly payments as low as possible. Interest only allows you to make overpayments, even though on a monthly basis you're you're paying um, just the interest. You can still pay off your mortgage when you want to. You might as well keep that cash and invest elsewhere because you're going to get better returns than what you're paying in in a in interest. So. Definitely, all investors at the moment do interest only. People that are buying main residence usually do repayment. So that's very, very different kind of product. Um, yeah. And so one more I just saw, by the way, uh, Indian residents. Uh, yes, absolutely. And this product is also available for Indian residents. Um, yeah, uh, yeah I've, I've had quite a few done, actually. People based in India, earning in India. Uh, you can get a buy to lay in the UK for a UK bank. What is the minimum initial capital to start uh, investing via loan? This can be for um, Widya or Marian. Sorry, can you repeat that? What is the minimum initial capital to start investing via loan? Yes, I will answer that. Um, so typically, typically, I would, I would say, say 25%, 25%, but that's the very minimum. So 75% is the maximum borrowing, um, the complete maximum borrowing. Uh, but, but of course, course most people would do 30 to 35% total, total down payment, payment or deposit and borrow 65 to 70% on the loan because you just don't want to work off the extremes. You just want to be on the safe side. Uh, maybe Vidya can answer this question. Uh, what is the tax rate for rental income? What's, What's the tax, tax rate? rate? Yeah. 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 Um, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Now? All right. So um, we are not a qualified tax accountant, but we can, of course, recommend you to one. But just um, simply... Um, the income tax, yes, because you are earning rental income, you will be subjected to income tax. So if you have one property, you will be at the lowest band, which is at 20% on your net income, uh, whereby you can deduct a lot of uh, expenses like your service charge, your uh, letting and management fee, um, anything that is towards the property, um, if you have a good accountant, they will be able to uh, file it properly for you. Uh, just to give an example, I have uh, two in the UK and I just filed for the year 2022 and the income tax that I have is still under the lowest bracket despite having two income stream because there's a lot of deductibles and it was only like £100 or something that I have to pay, very little. Mm -hmm. Oh, Marion can also add to, to that. Yes, yes. So, so I'm not I'm a tax not advisor tax either, advisor, but I do have, have some tax, tax knowledge. Tax knowledge. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 yeah, so basically, uh, you do have what Widya mentioned. If you have uh, one or, or two properties, uh, you you can deduct a lot of the maybe mortgage costs or running costs or whatever. But you also have a, a threshold initial threshold um, of 12 and a half thousand pounds um, each year of profit. So the first 12 and a half thousand pounds per person does not get taxed. So if there's two people buying, for example, you split, you know, a husband and wife, you both have the 12 and a half thousand pound initial kind of not, you still have to file your tax return, but it will, anything, any profit above that will then get taxed. So for your first property or two, it doesn't really, you know, it's not much of an impact. So yeah, basically that's that's kind of the the short answer of it. It's you're not gonna if you're buying a 
one or two properties, it's fine. Of course, if you're buying multiple properties or if or, or if your property is more than two, three million, then obviously speaking to a qualified tax advisor would be best to understand your situation and how to structure your investment properly. All right, thank you. Um, that would uh, conclude our webinar today, that last question. Do you uh, do our panelists wanna add uh, any last few words before I close the webinar? Yeah, um, you know, I am visiting Jakarta next month. So I'm really looking forward to uh, all our Indonesian investors uh, next month. Um, I know that there's so much to cover and we can't cover everything in one webinar. So thank you for staying all the way to the end. Please do uh, be in touch with Alia and myself for a private one-to-one -one consultation. We can have a Zoom meeting with Stephen on board, Marion on board if you need. Uh, and also thank you for uh, staying with me despite my uh, difficulties while presenting with this flu. So I really appreciate that. I'm really looking forward to see you next month.